The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, J.V. Johnson, and I'm in the middle of Hermageddon. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reasons to be bothered by what's going on, on around the world. I'm looking for something that's a little bit funny, something that we can chuckle about to forget uh, the nastiness of all of this. And the fact my hair is out of control, I think, is going to be that thing. I think that what we'll do is we'll start, um, and I'll start taking suggestions as to how I can start preparing it because it is getting so long. And I, this doesn't, the headphones keep it in place right now. So you can't even really tell. Anyway, welcome to the program, everybody. It's great to have you along. We've got a, a very interesting conversation ahead of us tonight with Annie Mattingly. She's written a book um, about after-death communication. In fact, the book is called The After-Death Chronicles, True Stories of Comfort, Guidance, and Wisdom from Beyond the Veil. And we're going to talk to her about after-death communication, particularly with our loved ones that we've lost, because it's not only common, but it's of vital importance. So we'll look, at, we'll look at that, and we'll look at ways that we can encourage, we can recognize, and we can support it. And we'll also address any fears that people may have and how to protect ourselves from what might be considered a frightening contact from the other side. Just a couple quick things. I want you to make sure that you take a moment and go to the YouTube page if you haven't done that up till now. Find the J.V. Johnson channel and subscribe to it, please. 600 or so back episodes of the program there. A lot of great material for this uh, this self-quarantine, staying at home, social distancing, whatever you want to call it. It seems a little more than social distancing these days. It's really like, be, stay at home. Don't go anywhere. And if you have to go to the grocery store, wear a mask and do the right things. But we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see how the plays out. But anyway, the YouTube channel has about 600 back episodes. That's uh, a great way to occupy some time. In addition to that, go to uh, any podcast distribution platform and you'll be able to uh, subscribe to the podcast version of the show. That's also a great way to stay informed and up on the topics that we talk about. So we'll go to break, and when we come back, we'll bring our guest in again tonight. We'll, we, we will be talking with Annie Mattingly about after-death communication. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. We've got a fantastic discussion ahead of us tonight. Our guest, Annie Mattingly, is a writer, speaker, workshop facilitator, an after-death communication researcher and experiencer. If there are certain things, there are things in life that are certain. Taxes is one of them. Death is the other. And uh, one thing I know that loss has touched all of us at some point in our lives, whether it's a grandparent, a parent, and uh, heaven forbid, a child, um, or maybe somebody uh, a little further away from your inner circle. But it doesn't matter. A loss is a loss, and we grieve over those losses. And Annie's got some good news for us tonight in our conversation. Annie, welcome to Beyond Reality. It's great to have you here. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I want to ask you right out of the blocks here, a kind of a, it's a very semantic question, but I'm just curious. Um, I often hear what we're going to talk about tonight is afterlife communication, but you call it after death communication. Is there a difference between those two terms? I don't think so. It's just a matter of choice, okay. what you call it. <laughs> I, was a little, um, I, w I was a little curious about it, just because um, um, I thought maybe there were some subtle differences here that you were going to going to point out. But they're interchangeable, is what you're telling me. I, I think so. I think so. It's well, just a matter of semantics. Well, then how how are um, how did you become interested in this particular topic and this particular idea? This is not something that we often um, we might think about it, but we don't often write books about it or research it. But you did. Well, I didn't expect to be doing it, but life life handed me a great big challenge, and then that was followed by a very large gift. And the challenge was that my younger daughter became quite depressed and suicidal, and we had this very difficult few years where she was making attempts and nothing was helping, and she finally did take her own life, which uh, there's no words to describe how terrible that was. For, as a mother, um, but then a few weeks later, she visited me <laughs> and woke me up one morning, <laughs> and it was it was incredibly shocking and also wonderful. And then she proceeded to continue to visit me uh, on a for many months on a daily basis, um, and I became fascinated by the subject, and I wanted to know why we weren't talking about it more. 
Yeah, I, I'm, first of all, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, Thank you know, you. one of the things they that is often said with a, with a great deal of wisdom is we should never have to bury one of our children because I cannot imagine the horror that comes along with that. But it sounds to me as though as terrible as that was, um, you said a blessing as well. Or not not that the event was a blessing, but a blessing came after the fact. Right. And right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious though. Um, I don't. I, I'm going to have to make some assumptions here. I don't know. You know. I don't know if you if your parents are still alive or grandparents. You know. You've lost no. other people in your lives, mm-hmm. and, and it wasn't until your your daughter's passing that you started to recognize these communications. Well, there was um, some communi- a, a very different. I had a dream following my parents' death. Okay. They died very close together, sixteen days apart. So that was also a very shocking experience, and. Um, I had a dream a few weeks later that was um, caused me to make some the beginning of some peace and acceptance with over the fact, especially the fact that they had died so close together. Yeah. And uh, but it was a dream, and I had always been interested in my dreams, and I thought that was basically that was it. You know, I'd had this very lovely dream. Um, I didn't think of it as after-death communication at all. And I had given a lot of thought to, okay, what happens after we die? I was very interested in that. I'm interested in the invisible realities, (laughs) the ones we don't see with our physical eyes, and I always have been. But the the concept of someone speaking to you (laughs) who had died was just not in my vocabulary, you know? Uh, until until my daughter's death. Um, uh, let, let me let me kind of set the stage and the tone here because there's a lot of anguish around us in the world. It, there it, is. You know, even yeah. even in normal times, people are dealing with death constantly. And now we've got mm-hmm. something that's not only causing a lot of death, but it's causing a lot of fear. Uh, is it safe to sum up our conversation tonight? By the end of this conversation. We might have some hope. We might have a better understanding that uh, that maybe death is not the end. I hope so. That is part of the purpose of my book and my work. Is I, I'm hoping to offer people the opportunity to understand that there's a lot more to existence than what happens just while we're breathing, <laughs> right. and. Uh, and that I think that death is is one of the biggest. Well, you said something about this in the beginning, but when you were introducing me, it's one of the biggest challenges we have as our fear of our own death and this awful grief that occurs when someone else dies. And this doesn't make that go away. The idea, it, it, even, no matter how much you accept the concept of or experience uh, the concept of after death communication, it doesn't make grief stop. But it helps, and it helps with the fear uh, to have an understanding that we continue beyond uh, the the physical life. I want to go back to your story. You had um, a terrible loss with the loss of your daughter. You d- you you started to receive messages that helped you with that. Um, but then you decided to research and put this stuff together to offer hope to other people. Uh, how did you go about? researching and looking into this in, a, in an academic then and also maybe a spiritual way? Well, it started with my friends because I, I, I was having this incredible experience on every day and I decided I was going to, it was, it took some courage really to speak about it at first. Uh, I was afraid people would denigrate the experience sure, or, or yeah. laugh at me or just not believe me. Right. And I told the first person, and I think it was a woman. I, I'm try, I can't remember which one was the first now. And she told me of an experience she had. And I knew this woman. I had known her for a while. And I found it surprising that she hadn't told me this before. But she, too, was protective of that experience. Mm-hmm. So that gave me the, the, the uh, guts to ask somebody else <laughs> or tell somebody else. And they had another experience, and it just went like that, that everybody I told this to in the beginning either had had their own after-death communication experience or someone very close to them had had one, um, you know, like their mother with after their father's death had had an experience or something like that. And I was just astonished. And so then I just put 
once I made up my mind that I was going to uh, study this and then to write about it uh, and told people that, it was like an outpouring. Uh, people were calling me on the phone. People were emailing me. That people were saying, oh, I'm in Florida, but, you know, I'm in New Mexico. But they were saying, I'm, I'm in Florida, but I heard from my sister that you are, you know. <laughs> And it just went like that. It was it was so easy that in the end I cut it off because I felt like I was going to be interviewing people forever and I wasn't going to get to write the book. You know, there's a disconnect between people who would, who might admit they believe in something like that versus the number of people who maybe haven't experienced it. But I can't think of a single person who I know close enough to actually have a conversation about the loss of a loved one where they don't say, um, you know, that either that person came to me in a dream or or in many cases, it's I don't know why I haven't heard from them in my dreams yet. A lot of people are mm. waiting for it to happen. Um, and I know with myself, when I, my father passed, he was the first of my parents to pass. Uh, it took two years before he came to me in a dream. But it seems mm-hmm. to me that people, even if they don't necessarily admit it from a logical standpoint, will mm-hmm. expect that kind of communication. Well, I have been... I've noticed, I've never, I haven't documented this, but I'm a big reader. I read lot, all kinds of things. And I noticed that in fiction, almost everything has some tiny reference to some kind of communication that happens after somebody died. So it's there, but we're, it's almost like we're afraid to put it down in, in nonfiction. We only put it in, the, in what we make up. But it's in the consciousness. And I think... If we go back in history to other cultures, to indigenous cultures, for the cultures that preceded us, they called on their ancestors constantly. They expected this, and that's maybe maybe in our DNA, and, uh, and then we fight it with our minds and go, no, it's not logical, that's not what happens, you're dead, you're dead, you know. I think somewhere along the way, and this is not just with uh, the ability to, or the idea of communicating with uh, those that have departed, but it's 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 there are other things, ghosts, just the idea of ghosts and and these other things that we might consider supernatural or spiritual in many ways. We're taught as kids that nah, don't talk to your imaginary friend because it's not real, it's not there. Uh, exactly. You know, we're we're, mm-hmm. we're conditioned very very early to close that part of our mind and mm-hmm. our soul off. How yeah. how does that affect us? <laughs> It, it's it, it's like trying to function with only one arm, I think, you know, <laughs> because we don't believe that in the possibilities of this rich, the, these rich gifts that we have. Uh, I mean, it's not just that it's comforting to have, it was comforting to me to have this communication with my daughter, certainly. But when I think of all the stories, that, the things I've experienced and the stories I've heard from others, it saves people's lives sometimes. Uh, you know, a woman is driving, and her her daughter's voice, her dead daughter's voice, tells her, "Mom, bring the car to a stop." Well, she doesn't. She doesn't say stop the car. You know, which would be slam on the brakes. Right. Bring the car to a stop. So there's a, a, a green light up ahead, and the woman drives to the green light. You know, not that far. You know, I don't know, less than a half a block, something like that. She drives to this green light, and she stops at the green light because her daughter told her to, and a great big truck ran the red light oh, right wow. in front of her. Wow. I, I, that, that's the, the strongest example I've heard, the most dramatic example I've heard of the life-saving value of this kind of experience. But this, I think that other cultures, older cultures mostly, or more natural cultures, Knew it, they expected this to happen that that that, that dad would tell you, what, you know, what to do and it would be of value. I um I don't know which cultures it it is and I think they're Eastern cultures primarily but there are some cultures whose entire spirituality it, or, or their entire spiritual connection is based on contact through their ancestors isn't that true? Yes. Yes. So it's not foreign. It's foreign to us, but it's not foreign in the world. There, there are right. there are significant cultures that that take that very seriously. Mm-hmm. I, I I did some um, a research expedition. It wasn't related to after death communication. This was a long time ago before I was into this. Um, in 
uh, Fiji and uh, sat on a on a porch with these shamans who were that's their whole role in the culture was to call in the ancestors that's what they did um, and they called in the ancestors for advice on how to how to live their lives how to run their communities and their villages so you mention as you start talking about these communications, you describe them as common and heal mm-hmm. and healing. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, common in that I, the the those who do large scale researchers research on this subject say that someplace between twenty and fifty percent of people have had some experience like this. I'm thinking it's more like fifty because. There are all those people who won't admit it you know, or don't recognize it. They don't realize what the experience that they've had. Uh, so that, to me, is common. If half of us have had some kind of common uh, uh, experience, and it may be more than that, I, I think I'm being conservative by saying half, um, have had some contact with a dead beloved, that makes it common. And healing... Uh, the most common ex- uh, expression I've heard, it's so, it's so simple that it's almost comical, is, I am okay. That's what the dead come and say <laughs> most often, is, I am okay. Well, those three words are so healing to someone in grief that it's just, uh, it, it can't be measured. It yeah. can't be measured, because that... It seems to be just natural for us to be concerned about someone who's died. Are they all right? Are they all right? Are they okay? And when they come and say they are, it's incredibly wonderful. That's the simple version. But there are other versions, too, that are much more complex because some, you know, a lot of times our relationships are challenging and not that healthy. And often when someone dies and we've we've got this leftover stuff, this unfinished business that is hanging around because dad was always drunk or or, or mom was always mean or whatever it is that that was going on. And through after-death communication, sometimes those wounds can be completely healed. I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't change what happened when they were alive, but because people seem to mature after death and come to see their own flaws and faults uh, more clearly, they are often able to communicate in a way that uh, makes the living person understand, it, 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 it restores the bond between them that, that wasn't healthy when the person was alive. You just mentioned, pretty... yeah. You just mentioned that uh, there seems to be some type of maturing, or some maybe even a bit of a change. Uh, mm-hmm. I have to ask you this, and I'm not, this isn't necessarily your area of expertise, but you may have encountered it. We've had a few folks on the program recently talking about near death experiences and actually having mm-hmm. a taste of the other side, if you will. And mm-hmm. in all cases of this discussion, there is some type of life review that seems to happen, some type of process by which you you see what you how your actions have affected people through those people, through their mm-hmm. eyes. Mm-hmm. Is that do you think that's the process by which there is a change or a, uh, a mature uh, maturing of an individual going on post um, you know once they've passed? Well, that's my guess that that's part of it. You know, it, it, I don't know. You know, all of this is a mystery. Not, sure, yeah. I'm just get it, taking from what I've gathered and and experienced. Um, so I think that that is part of it. But maybe in the be- maybe there is other mm, teaching or healing that occurs, and this is a that the life review part is an aspect of that. I'm thinking to the early things that happened with my daughter. It was obvious right from the get-go that she had changed because she was so troubled when she was alive. And all of a sudden she was calm and serene and seemed wise. But she also had that, this is, this takes us into a a different turf, um, the life review concept. Uh, I, I can cover two things here. Because the only time in all the hundreds of visitations that I've had with her that there was anything frightening 
was um, an evening when I was I was it was a few months. Mm, it was within the first two months of the of the uh, of her death, and I was watching a movie, in uh, in a DVD at home, and in, totally engrossed. And I began to feel like I was getting really sick. Um, my stomach was upset. I just felt terrible, and I couldn't even concentrate on the movie. And as soon as it was over, I just got into the bed, laid down, and at once I was aware of my daughter's presence, and it was not pleasant. Uh, she was like a hornet's nest of anxiety. And the impression that I got was that she was uh, re- doing that, some kind of life review, and she had come upon aspects of her mothering that she was really disturbed about, about how, how she had behaved. And I was just, I was feeling so bad physically. And I said to her, um, you have beings there who can help you more than I can help you on this, and this is not good. And I sent her back. And and instantly, my body felt fine. All that Mm. uh, sensation of sickness was gone. Mm. I I was just totally okay. So I went to sleep. I slept, came, got up in the morning, and or woke up in the morning. I was still in bed, and she came, and she was completely calm again, back, back to where she had been before. And I asked her, I said, now that you're calm, I said, is there anything I can do to help you? And she said, you could hold me. And we did. We held each other. And it was as physical as if I was holding her her body. Wow. Uh, and it was totally beautiful. And then we talked a little bit, and she was she was really not happy with some of the things that she had done in her parenting. And I was able to say that I also had made mistakes in my parenting, including with her. And so we were like two equal beings. We weren't in that situation. It wasn't like we were mother and daughter at all. Um, We were just two women who had made mistakes in our lives. And we comforted one another. And it was, it was quite beautiful. And it also taught me that if you don't like what's going on, pe- people are afraid, you know, of, of, of the dead sometimes. The whole movie thing about zombies and ghosts <laughs> sure, and <yeah>. so on. <laughs> and uh, it, it taught me that we have a lot of power there. If we don't like what's going on, we can say so, and we, can, we have control over it. Um, so that was a good lesson in itself. Yeah, I, I want to see if you agree with this. Uh, you, in talking about how common this is, you said, I think, and again, just quoting you, uh, paraphrasing more than anything else, so like half the people uh, mm-hmm. have, have uh, said they've had these types of experiences. Would you go as far to say as the other half have had them and just haven't recognized them? I don't know if they all have. I think that there there's some mystery in why some people don't have communication, but I think some of them have. I do. I do, because that happens sometimes when people find out what my work is and they'll ask some questions and and they'll I'll ask them if they've had some experiences and they say no and then a few minutes later they say well there was this one time but it was probably nothing yeah and then they proceed to tell me something that is quite obviously an experience of connection with the dead and when I acknowledge that that is true that I've maybe heard other experiences similar to that they they will sometimes cry they're so because they want they want to know that this is okay, but they're afraid to. Um, I think they're often just afraid that people will um, find them foolish or yeah, it's not that, believe them. It's that yeah. fear of ridicule that keeps a lot of people quiet. Do you see a change in that, though? It seems as though more people are becoming more willing to have these dis- uh, these conversations. As people like you introduce these ideas through books or, or discussions like we're having tonight or television programs, mm-hmm. whatever it happens to be, do you think the culture is starting to change a little bit? Are we reaching a corner here? I think so, but I might be biased, you know, yeah. <laughs> because people 
uh, when they hear about my work, they, they talk to me. So it looks to me like a lot more people are, but I'm not sure it's really true. I, I, I wish it was. Is it, in your experience, is it only, um, I guess what we would say, uh, beloveds or loved ones that have passed that, that will send us these communications, or can it come from anyone who's passed? Well, I think it can come from anyone who's passed, but I th- also think the most obvious path is the path of love. So when there's a love bond with someone, I think it, it, it's an opening uh, that allows the experience to, to be received. Um, but there's also, once that opening is there, once a given person is aware of that opening and has traveled that path of connecting with someone they love who's died. It it stays open, I think, and makes for the possibility because sometimes then people send messages through that person um, for someone that they may not know very well at all or from someone that they may not know very well at all. So uh, there is the possibility of receiving from others. What do you think about uh, spiritual mediums or people that uh, act as some type of intermediary between us and those that have passed, do you think that they're making a connection that we don't have the ability to make, or do you think they're just helping us recognize things that are already happening? Well, I think they are helping us to recognize things that are already happening, and I wish that there would be more um of a tendency and a part of mediums and psychics to consider their role of one of teaching, uh, showing people that they can do this themselves, and some do that, but not all. Um, there's, you know, ego gets involved sometimes, and they can, you know, they can be really proud of the fact that they have this wide open consciousness that that makes the connection. But I, I and I'm. I, I have no disrespect for this that field, um, and it is, is very helpful to people at times. Very, very helpful. But I, I don't. I want people to understand that they can develop something of that themselves, even if they're not as open as every psychic or medium is. Yeah, I guess my my question was more along the lines because they do, they do some very good work and I've actually been a bit of a skeptic and have had my mind changed by some of these discussions I've had. But mm-hmm. um, is it more that they're breaking down barriers to the other side or they're breaking down barriers within us? I think it may be both. Okay. I think it may be both. Tonight we're talking about after death communication with Annie Mattingly. Her book is called The After Death Chronicles. Annie, you told us about the loss of your daughter and you said it wasn't long after you lost your daughter that you started to get messages from her. How did all of that start, and what was your initial reaction? Well, it was it was an astonishing morning. I had I was still asleep, and at that point, it was only a few weeks after her death, and I was it. I hated waking up in the morning yeah. because for the first few seconds, maybe I would forget, you know? <laughs> and then I would remember that she was still dead. It felt like. She was still dead. And that morning, I felt a rush of energy, kind of like a goosebump sensation up the left side of my body. And it was strong enough to woke me up. And I uh, turned over in annoyance. I tried to bury myself back in the pillow. And it happened again. And it was stronger. I put the pillow over my head. <laughs> and the, the third time that it happened, my whole body, it just rippled from my feet all the way to my head, wow. just this incredibly strong energy. And I sat up, and this, this is the key moment, and I hear it and I've heard it since then in other stories because uh, I don't know where this came from. I just said, Randy, that was her name, Randy, Randy, is, is that you? And it was uh, as astonishing to me as could be imagined that I would even say that. And, and you actually uh, then, verbalized that. You actually said I it. I did. Okay. I said it out loud. Mm-hmm. I said it out loud. And uh, I said, is that you? And then I said, if it's you, move something or do something so I know. And I'm looking around the room. It was just barely light. I'm looking around the room and nothing is happening. 
and there was a pause, maybe 30 seconds or so, and then her voice, and it was, it wasn't in my head, this was her completely recognizable voice, said, your body knows. And I found myself feeling my body, not with my hands, but just going through my, and realizing that, I, that that's why I had said, Randy, is this you? Because I knew, I knew I could feel her presence. And that's all there was to that first morning. <laughs> there was nothing else except my astonishment, because I just sat there with these waves of wonder going through my body. And I was, it, it was, I was comforted. I was not in any way frightened, but I I was comforted because I knew that if I could feel this and she could speak to me in that way, that she was all right. And that was a wonderful feeling to have. Sure. And how long would you say that whole um, encounter lasted from the point when you started to feel first feel the sensation um, up your legs to the point where you got an answer from her? Um, a minute, minute and a half, not long, not long. And that minute and a half changed a, a lot, if not everything, for you, didn't it? It did. It did. It did. It was astonishing to... It, it, well, it changed things that I didn't even know had changed. The right. first thing it changed was my feelings about her and, and our relationship and her death and that sense of incredible sense of comfort. But then underlying that, well, though I didn't realize it yet, was this uh, firm understanding that uh, and it wasn't no longer a concept or an idea or a hope that, uh, that life continues after death or that existence continues after death. It was a knowing. I knew for sure. When you had that experience, did you immediately um, try to, uh, uh, I guess, in, uh, what's the word, um, solicit more? Did I mean, did you work no. it from that? You did not. No, I didn't. Uh, I was just, I had really no expectation that there would be more. Um, I, I felt so, that it was such a gift. Uh, I just felt incredible gratitude. Um, and I think... It was a few days that I just had this welling up of feeling of gratitude, uh, uh, but no more connection. And then a few days later, uh, also first thing in the morning, that's when almost 99% of our contact has happened in that way. Um, She was there again, and then uh, we began to speak. We held conversations. I'm sorry, I, I may have missed something. Was this the, the following days? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, that was a few days later. A few days there later. A, a few days later. A few days after the first experience. The first experience was probably two weeks after her death, and then it was a, there was a there were a few more days when I had no experiences, and then we began the daily visitations. Was there was there something significant about the mornings between you and your daughter that maybe? would have made that the right time for her to reach out to you? Or do you think that maybe, you know, as you're, as you're coming out of sleep, uh, you, you might be more accessible to um, someone from the other side? I think the latter. Uh, I am, that's been always my most powerful time. It's when, you know, decisions I'm worried about, the resolution comes, the answer comes, the words come. Um, it's when I'm most clear and most spiritually connected. And in fact, over, over time, what began to happen is that, because I, I do a, have a practice of doing mantras first thing in the morning, and uh, she would often, I would often feel her presence while I was in that practice. Um, and I, I think it's simply my most open time. How old was Randy when she passed? 47. 47. So she was well into adulthood. Yeah, she had a teenage a daughter in college. Mm, how tragic. Um, so as these communications continued, did they take the same form every time? No. Um, I did feel sometimes, uh, I still, and it's been um, heading towards 10 years, 
um, I still feel her on the left side of my body, uh, but it's much more mild now. It was never strong again, like like that first time. Um, and mm, so it would be just at this simple little tingling up the left side of the body and an awareness of her presence and then whatever words were spoken. Um, communications often come in the form of dreams as well. Did you have dream communications or were these uh, dream references that I know you talk about uh, from other people's stories? They were from other people's stories. I I never really had a strong after-death communication dream with her. She there were other people who had dreams with her. My my husband, her stepfather, had a powerful dream with her, a couple of them, I think. Um, so it's not that she didn't enter into dreams, but not mine. mine. My communications were always of this nature. What is it about the dream state that seems to remove some of those barriers of communication? Well, I think for one thing, we're less afraid of them. People who might be cautious to say, "Oh, I saw I saw my mom in the bedroom last night," you know, <laughs> are less cautious about their their dreams. They, it it breaks down some of those barriers of uh, fear of of ridicule and so on. Um, so that is the most common way that that people do have after death communication contact. I'm doubled my words there. after this communication. <laughs> some, some people um, believe, especially uh, when we talk to dream experts, th- not all dream experts, but some, believe that there's some something occurs during the dream state that actually uh, there's, there's a projection going on. Your soul or part of your essence actually travels somewhere to a point, to a place where... Uh, you can actually talk with people that have passed. Do you find any evidence of that or believe anything like that? I think it's entirely possible. Uh, I think that, of course, we do need to be open in our dreams to that, and and certainly some movement towards the person is part. I mean, Randy said to me once, I asked her, um, what was it? I, oh, because uh, there were some people in her life who were wanting contact and didn't feel they were having it, and I asked her why she didn't come to them, and and she said, well, I do, but they don't know I'm there. She said, you, it's easier with you because you come towards me, mm. but I'm not aware of doing that. Mm-hmm. Do you have, um, what types of conversations did you start having as, as this became more routine for you and you were less surprised? And you recognize this was actually something that was that, that could be rather normal and, and, as you've said, educational and comforting. What types of conversations did you start having at that point? Oh, no, I haven't even thought about that for quite a while. I have to think a little bit. Sometimes they had to do with my concerns over her daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I tried to ask her what was happening there in 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 her, her her existence, and she didn't want to answer that. <laughs> you know? It was like, uh-uh, I'm not going there. You know? <laughs> I th- I, the impression I got was I needed to wait to find out when my own turn came to be there. <laughs> um, and she did, there, there was a time, this only happened one time, but there was a time when her daughter was, who was, by then she must have been about, 19 or 20, I think, because it was a couple of years later, uh, she was going to take a trip, um, a driving trip with a, a, a bunch of friends. And uh, Randy came to me and said, I do not want her to go. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't want her to go? Why? Well, she wouldn't tell me why. I couldn't get an answer. I never got an answer, but she was so strong. Do not let her go. And I said, look, she's she's not a child, you know, I can't stop her. She said, well, then just try, just, just tell her what I'm saying and see if you can get her to stop. So I did tell her daughter and I think she was maybe a little annoyed. It's like, Hey, you didn't hang around to be my mother. Now you're telling me what to do. And I'm 19 or 20 years old. Uh, but an interesting thing happened over the course of the next, uh, uh, maybe a week in the planning, one by one, each of the people on that trip 
couldn't go for various and sundry reasons, so it all fell apart, and she ended up flying um, across the country instead of driving across the country. Uh, so there were there were was an element of, of advice at times, um, but mostly it was not that uh, it wasn't that large in a way. It was simple conversations, mm-hmm. not not big things. Although she definitely encouraged me about writing the book, and there were times in the beginning when I was still because I was still grieving. And it just seemed overwhelming. It's like, oh, I can't do this. Deal with the, uh, your estate and, uh, and the trust for her daughter and dealing with uh, writing the book and doing the interviews. It w- and she was going, it's all right. Just stick to it. Just do it a little bit every day. It's fine. You know, she was, she was like the mom then, <laughs> encouraging me. <laughs> so that was part of what happened between us. Uh, one of our uh, chat room members has had a question about how you were hearing the conversations. Were you hearing them audibly, like through your ears, or was it more telepathically? Well, that's a really wonderful question, because I didn't even think about that for a long time. But the, that first experience I had, it was audible. It was her voice, and it was coming just as though she were speaking in the room. From the room, room from the All room. All yeah. of the conversations after that were internal. Um, they, it was like a voice inside my head. And at times, it, I worried that it was not, that I wasn't being, that I was interpreting it rather than hearing it, and because and, I would write these things down, um, and that I, that I was not uh, being as true to what I was hearing as I wanted to be. Um, and I asked her once, I said, well, I'm a, I worry about this. I said, what a, it, sometimes it feels just like my, my thoughts. And she said something about us, not just the two of us, but of all of us being just one. So that didn't matter. Um, I don't know. But it, it, it was a worry for me because it was inside my head, not outside. One of the things you say about uh, for other people trying to experience and recognize these experiences, you say we need to unleash ourselves from logic and allow mm. mysteries embrace to enfold us. What do you mean by that? Well, if we think about this too much and try to, we want things to be proven to us. We want things to be to fit into the scientific model that says this is what's this is possible and this isn't possible, um, we trap ourselves in such a way that we can't receive these experiences because they are outside that model. We try, people try to use the scientific model to prove that uh, after-death communication is real, and they get so excited if, for instance, something you're told something and then that, let's say you're told where the will is, and then you find it there, and you had no way of finding it without this information coming through. That just gets people so excited. But it's to me, it's just as exciting that you have the contact uh, and have whatever emotional healing comes from that, regardless of whether it's provable. Um, but our culture teaches us that logic is is the god. You know, <laughs> that's the thing that we should be following. If someone hasn't really opened themselves up to these ideas or uh, been even looking for them, how would you recommend that they start paying attention so that they, too, might be able to experience some of this? Well, I think the desire, it starts with the desire, saying, I want to be open to this experience. But then we can do some very concrete things. We can create a, a little altar to to this person. Um, th- th- and that doesn't have to be some fancy thing that everybody would walk in the room and go, wow, there's the altar. It could be a corner of a shelf or a table or a desk, a candle, a photo, and then maybe spend some time there on a regular basis. I'm, I think the ceremonial aspect of choosing a particular time... <laughs> Friday night after work, Sunday morning, before bed on Tuesday, whatever it is, a particular time and saying, I'm going to spend 15 minutes in this place with this candle lit. Maybe I'm going to write a note to this person, or I'm going to speak out loud, 
or I'm just going to think in my head of what I would like to say to this person and be open to the possibility of having receiving a, a communication f- from them as well. Uh, so a little ceremony, a little ritual, uh, a conversation. For me, writing works, but that it doesn't work for everybody. For some others, it might be to draw a picture for them. Um, then you could also say that you're going to go on a walk, uh, on, a, on a particular particular walk, and you dedicate that walk to making contact, and then pay attention. Look at the birds, look at the butterflies, <laughs> look at the trees, and see if anything happens that mm, seems out of the ordinary. Um, what do you say? And to, then, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Well, just paying attention to to external and internal images, to sounds, to anything and everything, so that we can try to sidestep that doubt by acknowledging that all possible contacts, uh, all contacts are possible. And then, if we do get the smallest little thing where we go, oh, could that be something? <laughs> you know? right. Say thank you. And say thank you to John or Mary or whoever whoever it is we're trying to make the contact with. That sets up a uh, that starts to open the pathway between between us. There are a lot of people who may have done some of the things you just outlined or much more in an effort to make communication and just don't seem to be able to get that communication or at least don't recognize it. Is, is there something that, is there an expectation that people should uh, understand that maybe this doesn't happen as quickly as you want it to or as frequently as you want it to, and it just takes persistence? What do you tell people in those circumstances? Well, I, then we, that way, that's where we get into the mystery of this, that I don't really understand why it is that some people don't seem to have any experiences and other people have many. And I have even heard a very accomplished psychic say that she also had run into people who simply seem, the, the dead, who simply seem unavailable. They will not make contact. And so it's tricky. We don't want to start blaming ourselves that we're not doing it right. Um, that, you know, if I just tried a little harder, he would come to me. Um, that's, that's, that can cause problems as well. And another thing is that sometimes in the beginning, after I say in the beginning, it, it, in the closest time after a death, our grief is, can be so strong, and our desire, our longing for that person to be alive can be so strong that I think that sometimes the dead may stay away because the contact will only make that longing stronger for certain people. And so, so there's that, too. I think that it, especially in the early stages of grief, if you're not getting contact and you want contact, it may be better to just back off a little bit and say, this will come in its own good time, I hope. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We're talking with Annie Mattingly tonight. We're talking about after-death communication. Her book is called The After-Death Chronicles, True Stories of Comfort, Guidance, and Wisdom from Beyond the Veil. You can get more information about Annie and her work and her book at her website, Annie Mattingly, and there's an E at the end between L, the L and the Y of Mattingly. AnnieMattingly.com. Annie, um, I want to talk about people's experiences, but before that, a lot of what we've talked about is very, very subtle. And one of the things that I've always had a question about, because I'm a very pragmatic individual, is that why are the messages in many cases, seemingly yours weren't so subtle. I mean, being spoken to is not quite as subtle as, <laughs> as maybe a butterfly floating by or whatever it happens to be. Why are so many of these messages so subtle and not more direct? Well, I don't know. I can just, I'll start by saying I don't know. But I will say that much of mm, dreams, much of dreams, much of spiritual experiences, I think, 
they have a subtlety because we they are they are asking us to participate in this as well. They're not just going to be so blatant that we can say, "Okay, this happened. I'm supposed to do this." They they're asking us to try to figure out what it, our role is in this, but that's not a very complete answer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're asking me to. Yeah, um, I know. It's, to answer some pretty large questions here, and I, I'm, you know, I, know. I don't know who can. I know, <laughs> and, and they're the same questions that are on everybody's minds, and the reason they're on everybody's minds is because nobody has any real answers to things like <laughs> <Really>? this. <laughs> so, but don't fault me for asking them because I'm very, no, very no, curious. No, I don't. <laughs> um, let's talk about some of the experiences that people shared with you. You shared with us already one that was pretty amazing, where uh, um, a, a message was received which made a car stop that otherwise would have been uh, in an accident. What are some right. other messages that people uh, shared with you that uh, you you chose uh, to include? Well, there, there are so many, many experiences. Um, I've just recently heard one that was about uh, um, a man died at, at some distance, and, his, and information was sent to the family that he had died, but they had not seen his body. And uh, the family was down in the basement um, um, doing laundry, and the guy walked down the steps, and they go, wait a minute, we were told you were dead. And the, I think it's his mother or his grandmother, I'm not sure. Anyway, followed him up, back up the stairs into the kitchen. Now, I have to back up a little bit. They had been looking for his life insurance policy. They knew that he had one, and uh, the life insurance, they couldn't find it, and the life insurance company said that they couldn't uh, that they had to have the actual policy. And when she gets up to the top of the stairs, the kitchen, the man's not there, but the life insurance policy is on the kitchen table. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's that's more than just communication. That's actually physical manipulation and everything else that, uh, you know, and any paranormal investigator is going to call the holy grail. Exactly. It is. It is. And the thing is, I I, know, I I think when I die, this is the first question I'm going to ask: is how do you do this stuff? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not in the physical. How do you make this happen? How do you make hundreds of butterflies uh, congregate in one place? Um, how do you make uh, messages come through eagles or hawks or butterflies or, or anything of that nature? How do you make a rocking chair rock? when there's no one there, you know, right. quote-unquote. You know? Right. Um, so there are, there are it's, it's just astonishing what, what can be done. And then there are these, there are visions that people see when they're, they're, they're in their bedroom, they open their eyes, and on the wall it's a big white light across the room, and there's the brother and he says, I'm okay, I'm okay. And this is such an important message for the sister, because in that particular case, though I don't know why this one popped into my mind, but um, in that particular case, he had died by suicide, and she was terrified that sure. he was not all right. Yeah. There's so many messages about suicide that, you know, oh, oh, they're being punished, and it's an evil thing to do, and so on. And so people are afraid they're afraid for that person. The um, word frightening comes up kind of uh, intermittently and, and and not with a lot of frequency, but it does come up once in a while. Do people have frightening experiences with this communication or is it their own fears just getting in their way? I think it can be both um, because Certainly, that was frightening for me that time when my daughter uh, was so upset. Um, but we have such control that we we can stop that. That's I, I really want to make that. We have control to understood. to remove the fear from it. Is that what you're saying? We have the remo- control to say you can't do this. If something's happening that's frightening, I stop see. it. Okay. Just go away, okay. or 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 stop doing this. Um, and so I think it can be from either side. I don't have very much experience with, uh, or and have not heard much about frightening things. So I'm no expert on that. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to determine what my reaction would be. 
I mean, I, I of course, I'd, I'd love to hear from my parents more often. Um, but I'm not sure how I would react if I opened my eyes in the middle of the night and one of them was standing there. That might that <laughs> might frighten me. But maybe it's just for a moment. I don't know. I don't know. It, you must have had people share that experience with you. What was their reaction? Well, those with the visions, there was no one who was frightened. Um, there was one person who he kept asking for a bigger sign. He kept saying his, his brother had died, and um, he kept saying that he wanted a sign and things were happening, you know, a rainbow that seemed particularly astonishing. And uh, I think it was an elk uh, that came close to the car. A bunch of things happened. And every time he said, no, that's not big enough. And then he was lying in bed and he became aware that someone was sitting on the bed. And it did scare him to death. And he punched out. You know, he's a guy. You know, he punched right into that... And it went right through <laughs> the, the person, wow. and then he realized it was his brother. <laughs> so he was frightened, but he was frightened before he saw him. As soon as he saw him, he was no longer frightened. So the fear can go away once you kind of recognize what's going on. I guess it's more of a startling than a, than maybe a real yeah. legitimate fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although most people seem surprisingly not startled. Uh, it's um, that they, they seem to be describe it as that they're almost surprised that they're not star that they're not startled because it's so uplifting to them. I think. Is there anything that might determine whether or not we'd be contacted? Mo- removing our own barriers aside, uh, mm-hmm. does do you think there's something that has to happen in, in spiritually for those communications to take place? What do you mean by spiritually? I mean, on the other side, does something have to happen on the other side? I don't know, you know, I'm not sure that we can answer where these spirits reside, but wherever it is, does something have to happen for them to be able to communicate? I don't know. Don't have an answer. Do, I that, don't know. I'm wondering if any of the stories that, that you've uh, heard, or maybe even in your own conversations with your daughter, if um, you have any sense of where that other side, where that place might be. <laughs> I wish I did. Actually, I think I do. I think I do, but it, 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 it's hard to describe in words. Our language doesn't cover a situation in which everything is coexistent and in the same place. I'm not sure that the other side, it, it's the kind of phrase we have to use because that's how we think of it. They're there and we're here. But I'm tempted to believe that they are as present they're simply inter interrelating and interacting with us constantly um that there isn't another place uh, it's just another way of existing that feels blurry as though i'm not explaining it very well but i don't know how to explain it very well the sense that they haven't gone someplace else they've go, simply gone into another way of being uh, which is not physical, and I'm, I think that the, the non-physical and the physical are pretty well, strongly connected. How common is it for people to see communication from deceased loved ones in nature? It's fairly common. It's not as common as dreams, but it does happen regularly, especially with birds. Birds seems to be the, the strongest, the strongest one. Uh, they seem to be the best at communicating with us. Birds, and I also hear frequently butterflies. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is there something about those two creatures that make them particularly important when it comes to communication? Maybe it has to do with the free freedom to um, that they have of movement. They can fly, which is a pretty amazing thing. And I think even if we're not birders, birds and butterflies are beautiful to us and to most people. And they're also available. I, I've noticed that because you don't have to live in a, in a rural area to uh, have birds around. Even in, even in urban areas, there are birds present. So I've wondered if that is one of the reasons. I mean, it, you could have communication, say, from a bobcat, but only a few people are going to see bobcats. But if you go outside, 
or even just look out your window, many, many, many people will have the opportunity to see birds. You know, so I'm, I'm and, suspecting that that's part of it. Yeah, and as you're talking about this, I'm starting to chuckle a little bit because uh, my father had the type of uh, a sense of humor in that he's probably been, all those bats I've been seeing, he, he's probably using bats because uh, he, he, know, <laughs> he knows it would creep me out. And my father has that sense of humor. And they have wings too, right? They're free, they're free mm-hmm. to move. Right. So that makes and I sense. And think, I think you've, you've, you've hit on something important that that quality that it makes up a person's humor and their personality comes through in something like that who else would 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 show up as bats you know but if your father has that kind of humor um you recognize it well not only that but one of the first things my father ever gave me um that was his as a kid and he gave it to me when i was a kid was a poster an original movie poster of Bella Lugosi as Dracula. So <laughs> this is all starting to make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> it does make sense. <laughs> what, what so you it, had said that you had, communi- had had communication with him, right? A couple, some dis- time after his death. I took it took two years, and I finally had a dream uh, in which he did come to me and did v- v- the same thing that you have mentioned many, many times. Told me he was okay, and mm. I mean, he gave me a hug in that dream that was so real and and i mean it, it, it i felt it through my entire body and felt mm. it for days after mm. well you're describing you're giving a a textbook description of an after death communication dream it has that feeling that is so strong and that, and a hug that is so real it's more almost more real than a real hug would be and you know a physical yeah. hug would be yeah. and that stays with you that the, all of those factors uh, line up to be typical of of a true after death communication dream. And maybe, and you can tell me if this is typical in what you've heard from other people. But I feel like those dreams, and I haven't had many, but I've had a few mm-hmm. of these dreams between my mother and my father, and and for, and recently them together, which is nice. But um, the 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 feeling you get from the dream, the actual emotional feeling and comfort and and connection that you get from the dream doesn't necessarily match what happens in the dream. For example, one of my dreams was they were just sitting on the couch together. But mm-hmm. but I, when I awoke, I felt as though I had been, you know, with them in, in an embrace and a mm-hmm. loving embrace that I never felt during my whole, while they were alive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, what was happening in the dream didn't necessarily send me that message. Something else was giving me the message. And right. they, they were just appearing, uh, sitting on the couch. Mm-hmm. So there's more to it than what you see in the dream, I think. I, I absolutely agree with you. The dream is simply the the avenue for you to to recognize this contact, and then you get that the, the strength of the emotion. And what you're describing is a really strong emotion, and that's just the that's what shows that it's really after death communication. It isn't just you dreaming about your mother and father. We we dream about people who die, and that's different than these, these dreams that have this intensity to them. You said your daughter's communications encouraged you to write the book. How did that happen? Well, it, it seemed almost... The idea came in my mind, and it seemed to be my idea. And when I mentioned it, it was as though she was blessing it. Um, there was this feeling of, oh, this is what you're meant to do, you know? And uh, I felt it also. And it, it, there's actually something, I don't think I've ever talked about this to anybody before, but uh, some years before she died, she used to love Robin Cook novels. Um, they're about, they're medical mysteries. Mm-hmm. She was a doctor. Oh, okay. And she, she loved those, she loved those books. And I read one once and I didn't like it at all, you know? And one time I was writing a short story and I asked her for some medical advice about whether I'd handled the cancer situation with this woman correctly. And she said I had. And then she said, oh, she said, we should, we should write a book together. We could, you, you could do the writing and, and I could feed you the, the medical information. And she's thinking like a medical mystery. And I just kind of nodded and said, uh-huh. And <laughs> it never went any place. But it almost felt after 
her death and after I got into this idea of writing this book as though that's what we were doing. Not that she fed me, ever fed me any words, but she did feed me experiences because among her family and acquaintances, she actually came in nine different ways. <laughs> it was like, it felt to me like it was a checklist. Oh, well, I'll come to my dad in a vision, and I'll come to my stepdad in a, in a dream, and I'll come to my, uh, uh, this other woman as, in, a, in, a, as a, in a knowing, and it just went on and on. And at a certain point, I said, she's got a list, and she's just showing me all the ways. <laughs> that this can happen, you know, <laughs> unless I think that a, a, a given dead person uh, would be uh, uh, just a specialize in, you know, always coming in dreams or always coming in visions. No, they can come any way they feel like it, you know. <laughs> what, uh, how long ago did you lose your daughter? It will be 10 years this fall. Wow. Um, are you still uh, communicating and getting communication from her? Very little. Um, I feel her presence, um, and that even that is very subtle. Uh, but just a, maybe several times a month, I will feel a little bit of a tingle in my body. I say, "Ah, oh, she's here," and it, it, that's all that happens. But occasionally, I would say it. It might be only once a year now for the last few years. When there's a need, when there's something going on that's where I'm making a decision or something, she will come with strong recommendation. Um, I'll give an example. This happened. This is this is over a year ago, uh, and I don't. I don't. Think, I don't know. This might be the most recent verbal thing. Uh, her sister, um, who lived halfway across the country, uh, had been very ill, and I was going to uh, help her and I had planned because we were trying to line it up where uh, she was there was a lot of mystery in what was going on and she needed to see this neurologist and she had an appointment for a couple of weeks ahead so I was going to come in a week or 10 days so that I could be there for that appointment and Randy came and said uh uh-uh. <laughs> she said go sooner mm. and I by that time I had you know, for her to, if she says go sooner, I go sooner, you know? Yeah. So I made my reservations. I was there in three days, and the next day, the neurologist's office calls and says, we have a cancellation. Can you come tomorrow? Mm. So she, they know things, you know? Well, I don't know how they know these things, but they do. And that was very, it was very important that I be there for that appointment. And she knew it. And, of course, that also gave her sister, who has not, had contact like this at all, a sense of that Randy was there helping her as well. So it was good for me, but it was also good for her sister. Is there anything that we can do now while we're alive, while we're here, that will help us communicate after we're gone or help us prepare to do that? I think so. And I think that there's uh, definitely... uh, well, I had an, I'll just be very specific, I had an experience with a friend who was, this was several years ago, and she was she was dying of cancer, and I was uh, over, I had taken her some food, and um, uh, we were sitting and eating together, and she knew that I was writing this book, and she was very supportive of that, and I, she asked me, um, how did this come about? No, I guess I asked her. I said uh, if she would be willing to make some kind of an arrangement because we were talking about the whole subject of after-death communication. And she told me, she said yes, and then she started telling me this story, and I thought she was maybe getting off the mark here because she started telling me this story about this uh bird, some kind of violet bird of some kind that that was uh, fell into her wood stove and she rescued it and took it outside and when she when it flew off she cleaned it off. It had ash all over it. When she cleaned it off it, it and and released it with her hands it flew up and when she described that her whole face glowed. And it was really beautiful. Uh, 
but I didn't really know why she told me that story. And I couldn't remember the name of the bird, and I think it's probably because I didn't want to think about the fact that she was getting close to death. Mm. And uh, about a week later, uh, that was the last, well, maybe it wasn't even a week, few, fewer days than that, uh, but that was the last time that I saw her when she was able to communicate. After that, she was in the bed and not, not speaking. And... Um, she died, and the next day I went outside and had a bird start flying around me in this strange kind of a way, um, and it was flying and flying, and I, I suddenly went, "Could could that be her?" You know, yeah. Um, and it it just got more and more intense, and then this bird stopped on. I have a blue had a bluebird box uh, nest box, and it stopped on the side of the nest box, and it was like it was posing for me, and it let me walk really close, and then I dashed inside and I looked in my uh, Birds of New Mexico book, and I, the violet. What is a violet? You know, I look in the back, and there it is, and I. The the I forget what it was called violet winged swallow yeah and I thought was that what she said I wasn't sure but I turned to the page and there was a picture and it looked ex- it was just the pose everything about the pose it could have been a photograph that I had taken of that bird that I had just seen mm. and when I started to read through the text it said that it. it all kinds of things that were because I couldn't see violet on this bird, but it said, "Oh, when they're when they're perched, you can't see the violet." It uh-huh. said that. Yeah. It also said it likes to perch on nest boxes. Like that seemed like I had written that. You know, yeah. <laughs> it just seemed too strange, and it went on like that. So there were about four things like that. And as I'm reading this, I'm washed over with this joyful feeling, and I realized that this was my friend Anne. And I was just convinced. And here we had made this kind of casual arrangement that I hadn't even quite followed. Right. And yet it happened. It happened. And it was it was so the, the sense of joy was so intense that I almost felt embarrassed because I was supposed to be grieving my friend's death and I was joyous. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't last indefinitely, but it lasted for part of that day. And it taught me that, yes, we can make a plan. Annie, um, we've had a question that's scrolled through our chat several times, and I've been hesitant to ask it. And if it's too personal, please just say it is too personal. Okay. But in communicating with your daughter, did she express any regrets with what happened? I tried to get her to explain, and she didn't. Uh, for a long time, and then that is not too personal. These are important questions. Um, and then I had an experience um, where I was in a store, and and there was a woman there who was uh, having some problem, and I didn't. I kept passing her by and not paying any attention to her. And then I realized that there was something really wrong, and I stopped and I looked at her. And I saw that she was there. Really was something wrong. And I asked if I could help her, and she said that she was, and it took her a while to get this out, that she was having an anxiety attack. And she allowed me to help her out of the store. We left the stuff, the cart, her cart full of things, and I helped her out of the store. And I I had never seen someone so frozen. She was simply unable to move. She was leaning up against this shelf in the store for, I don't know, it could be 20 minutes. Um, and if I had not taken her out of the store, I don't know what would have happened. And she, she thanked me. She said it had taken her two weeks to get up enough, enough, enough nerve to get to the store. You know? And now she, she couldn't handle the experience. And that next day, that next morning, Randy pointed her out to me and said, that now you have some under something like you now you have some understanding of the state that I was in before. She said I was frozen. I was so frightened I could not move. Oh, wow. And that's the closest that she came to any kind of an explanation. But it was a pretty 
valuable explanation because I had seen this woman, the intensity of this woman's suffering. Uh, and, but that's the only thing. That's mm. the only thing. What do you want people to walk away with after they read your book? I want them to know that life, that existence does not stop at the moment of death and that they're, they can still have a relationship. Relationship doesn't stop with death either and that they can still make connection with people who have died and if they die, when they die, they can make connection with people they love who are alive and that that is a very, very valuable thing to to know and to experience. Annie, where can people find the book? I know you have uh, I, I'm, uh, links to it or information about it on your website. Where else can they find it? Well, it's on my website. It's on and through Amazon, through Abe's Books, through Barnes and Nobles, um, all of the all of the above, really, <laughs> and, pro- and other places too. Um, it's it's around. Uh, so if if you put the title of the book, the After Death Chronicles, uh, in uh, you you can find many sources for it online. And you got quite a uh, an endorsement. Dr. Raymond Moody um, uh, yeah. is on the you mentioned him, or he's got a quote on the cover. So um, he's he's a great individual. We've had him on this program before. Oh, have you? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. Thank you so much for a great evening and spending the time with us, sharing your personal, very personal story with us and, and the world through the, your book. Um, best of luck with it. And I hope we get a chance to get you back on the show at some point. Well, I've really enjoyed this. You're, you're a wonderful interviewer. I oh, just, thank you. It feels like just a conversation on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thanks for being here. And Annie, best of luck with the book. And uh, again, is the website the best place just to keep track of what you've got going on? Yes, and they can make, you, anyone can make contact with me there. If you've got any stories you want to tell me, I love stories. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.